Vanessa and half a day. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture is now called to order. Today's Wednesday, March 23, 2022. The time is 9.07 a.m. In compliance with the open government law, notices for this virtual public hearing were published in the Guam Daily Post on Wednesday, March 16, and again on Tuesday, March 22, 2022. And they were also posted to the Government of Guam Public Notice Portal and live and uh, sent to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets. This hearing is also live streamed on the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel. The Zoom meeting is hosted by the Legislature's AV staff and my committee staff, and I thank them for their assistance. The host will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and begin by stating their name for record keeping purposes. When called to speak, please ensure that you are unmuted. We have one agenda item today, and that is bill number 12-36 COR, introduced by Joe S. and Augustine. It's entitled, An Act to Amend Sections 7.111 and 7.112 of Article 5, and Section 7.86 B2A of Article 4 of Chapter 7, Title 9, Guam Code Annotated relative to expanding the Castle Doctrine, justification for acts of self-defense and eliminating the requirement of retreating before the use of force in the face of imminent danger. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues this morning, beginning with the sponsor of the bill, Senator Joseph Augustine. Also we have with us the Public Safety Chair, Senator Jose Pito Terlahi. We also have Senator Tello Taitigui, Senator James Moylan and Senator Anthony Abbott. To just Masi colleagues for being here today. Before we get to those who have uh, signed up to testify on the bill, I, I'm going to invite the sponsor, Senator Joseph Augustine, to please introduce the bill. Senator St. Augustine. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Bill number 12 uh, 36 CR. I introduce by myself an act to amend uh, section 7.111 and section 7.112 of Article 5 and 7.86 B2A of Article 4, all of Chapter 7, Title 9, Guam Code Annotate, relative to expanding the castle doctrine, just facing for act of self defense and eliminating the requirement of retreating before the use of force in the face of imminent danger. Um, to the people of Guam, on January 26, 2019, a man, 47, accused of storming apartment beating woman's boyfriend. June 6, 2019, machete attackers have criminal history. July 3rd, 2019, 24-year-old man charged with home invasion, family violence, and burglary. August 17, businessman came face to face with gunmen in home invasion. September 3rd, 2019, man accused of sexually assaulting woman during home invasion. 2014, July 14, 2021, man charged in home invasion stalking case. July 15, 2021, GPD looking for suspect in armed home invasion. The October 23rd, 2021, man charged in home invasion with special allegation of use of deadly weapon. November 15, I, I put a gun on his face. Neighbor stops home invasion. December 16, 2021, man on felony release in robbery charged in home invasion. February 16, 2022, man charged in burglary and sexual assault of women. Uh, these are just a few of the headlines in one of Wall Street's papers that I read when I searched home invasion. That's just home invasion. Imagine if I searched murder, rape, kidnapping, or robbery. What would I find? Good morning, Madam Chair, and I thank you for, for the opportunity to speak on this bill that has long awaited a public hearing, affording our people the opportunity to share their thoughts on the measure. Plain and simple, Bill 12-36 is a measure that will expand the castle doctrine to eliminate the requirement of retreating before using force in the face of imminent danger, authorizing one to use defensive force at home, in the workplace, in a vehicle, and when the person is in a place where he or she has the legal right to be in, taking a leisure walk along the beach, at a park, or walking to their car in the park lot at the, at the mall or store. For far too long, and times too many families and individuals have become victims of home invasion, robberies, assaults, rapes, carjacking, and thefts, and many other instances where this victim would be able to defend his or herself or property. The time has come for us to provide our people with the necessary tools to defend themselves and support their rights 
to live in peace and harmony without fear of someone biting their rights. The headlines, I, the headlines I read earlier are not new to us on one, neither is unusual for anyone to hear in the mainland. As many as 25 jurisdictions throughout the United States have enacted laws such as this. Their laws covers a person's life, home, vehicle, and property. While many of these laws in place, a deterrent from violators is that it exists. And oftentimes it was not necessary for individuals or families to exercise the use of the law. We must end the cycle of allowing individuals to ruin our lives and the lives of those we love when they commit such crimes that we should be able to determine if such application of the cash doctrine and the amendments provided in this bill are necessary to keep our families safe. The intent of this legislation is not to encourage a Wild West type of environment, it is to provide safety and security for our families. No one, and I say no one, should ever be victims of one's assault or fear for their lives or the lives of their family. Again, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity and for hearing this bill. I look forward to hearing the testimonies of those present today and ask that this bill be reported out so we may deliberate on the session floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator San Augustine. For the record, um, the committee requested feedback on Bill 12 from the Attorney General of Guam and the Prosecutor's Division, Office of the Attorney General, the Public Defender Service Corporation, the Guam Police Department, the Guam Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Family Violence and Coalition Partners, the National Association of Social Workers, Guam Chapter, Ihagan Famalao and Guahan, the Guam Bar Association, the American Bar Association, the American Civil Liberties Union, the National Association of, for the Advancement of Colored People, and of course, uh, the public notices that we sent for uh, throughout Guam. Uh, fiscal impact note, Bill 12 was granted a fiscal note waiver by BBMR, which states that the bill is administrative in nature and does not pose a fiscal impact to fiscal year 2021 appropriations. The fiscal impact note Um, sorry, that's all the fiscal notes that states this time. Uh, legal review is still pending. All right. So um, many of you are familiar with the kind of the history of this bill. So this bill uh, was also introduced in the last term and there was a hearing held. There was also a, a, an informational briefing on Guam self-defense law. And so, um, yeah, we will proceed now with the testimony on this bill. But the findings of the informational briefing on the Guam, uh, Guam self-defense law can also be found on the legislature's website under the 35th Guam Legislature uh, Committee reports on informational briefings. All right, so first uh, to testify, we'll begin with attorney Philip Tidinko. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Can you folks hear? Can you hear me, uh, Madam yes. Speaker? Yes. Okay. I, uh, for the record, I'd like to uh, ask that the legislature pull up my old uh, or my previous testimony from uh, that I submitted when it was, uh, I think, Bill forty-seven thirty-five about the stand your ground provisions. Uh, I think it was dated June 12, twenty twenty. But I'll, I'll just read it back again into the record because it's still relevant. Uh, uh, on the, as to this this bill, um, I and I, I would say by way of background, um, I don't see anybody here in the gallery that has served as a prosecutor. I've also been a public defender. I've been a prosecutor in three different island jurisdictions. I mean, I don't know why Guam wants to be like Texas, Georgia, and all these other places with stand your ground. I mean, in Hawaii, we implicit in their whole ponopono was about de-escalating and getting along instead of a shoot first, ask questions type provision. I mean, you're moving the castle to any location that a person thinks they have a right to. I think you're diminishing the castle doctrine when you added that clause. Not to mention that legally, and other than I, I see a few lawyers here who will probably argue because you scratch a lawyer and have a different opinion, but I think it's an ambiguity and inconsistency with the current uh, uh, what do you call uh, self-defense laws? And I don't really think the retreat provisions we have are really uh, such that people really have to um, be afraid of that. 
all those examples, Senator St. Augustine, that you named, they have nothing to do with be a retreating. Someone invades your house, you don't have to retreat. Someone puts a gun up against your head. I've had a gun up against my head. I'm a gun owner. I don't have to retreat. So I don't know what the problem is. I don't know why you need to make us like, I mean, you know, Texas, Georgia, other places. And if you don't think this has an impact on communities of color, which we have here, I mean, it's the ugly truth. Our Micronesian brothers and sisters, they're gonna be impacted by that. Because, and even our, even our tomorrow folks, you know, when someone says, I have a right to be here, you confronted me, boom, or stab. I mean, come on. How many of you have ever done a jury trial where retreating caused a problem? Okay. I haven't heard of any, uh, but of course I've been retired since 2017. Uh, I wish, uh, uh, you know, maybe I'm old school, I'm outdated. Maybe we should have had the prosecutor here. I think if you wanna make an impact on uh, what's happening to our folks, strengthen the police, strengthen the prosecutor's office. Uh, you know, maybe you should make them elected, the, the, the prosecutor. How about judges? We, we hear that they're, they're letting repeat offenders out on bail or third party. Let's make them elected, hold them accountable. But, you know, tweaking this to say from any location, I mean, that basically already exists, but you're just going to make it easy. In fact, now that I'm retired and of course I'm double dipping as a hearing officer, I hope that there's some vigilante committees members out there that I can represent because this provision gives us the right to what do you call uh, shoot first and ask questions later. So again, I, I hope I never have to testify on this bill again. Um, and again, if you're gonna do this, go through all the questions I asked. What are your compelling and urgent reasons for changing uh, the law? Why, what, what's your empirical evidence of this? I mean, all those examples you named, there's no, that's those circumstances don't call for retreating. Someone breaks into your house, you don't have to retreat. Someone breaks into your car, you don't have to retreat. I mean, now, what do you call, uh, if there's an opportunity to uh, de-escalate, you know, to move back in other circumstances, what, what's wrong with that? And again, I have not heard of any case where uh, the self-defense is, is what do you call hampered by the retreat element, if it even applies. I mean, look at those cases where people get acquitted, where there's a fight, the guy, chokes out the other guy and he dies. He gets acquitted. Come on, he didn't have to retreat. I mean, what are you, you pandering to the gun people? I'm a gun person, but I don't think you need this. You know, um, well, I mean, what's with this? You know, why are you trying to, does our tourism want our Asian tourism market to know that we're a shoot them first type of uh, place? Are people gonna wanna visit here? Do you think the Asian community uh, has these kind of concepts and values? No. We're an island community, okay? We're, we're not Texas, we're not Georgia. We don't shoot down our black people. We don't shoot down our brown people. Come on now, get real. That's all I have to say. I, I gotta go to work, I'm sorry. I'm, I won't be able to take questions. Uh, I still gotta earn a living, got a kid, some kids still in school. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, uh, Attorney Tedinko. We've also uploaded your prior testimony that you referred to uh, on the chat and onto the Google. Sorry. Thank you, Attorney Tedinko. We've also uploaded your testimony from the prior hearing onto the Google Drive and um, onto this chat for convenience. And all the testimony that our office has received has also been uploaded to the Google Drive, which and the link to the Google Drive has been provided to all the senators. All right. Again, just as um, I have to leave, but I, I, I'm not speaking for the AG's office, even though I'm a double dipper. Uh, I'm not a prosecutor anymore. Uh, I wish they were here. I wish the chief prosecutor was online or the attorney general, uh, but you know, times are different. Okay, thank you very much. I have to leave. All right, thank you. All right, I, um, I would also like to acknowledge that we've also been joined by Senator Chris Duenas, who's also present with us today. Um, all right, next we'll hear from, oh, well, I'd like to acknowledge that we did receive testimony from the Office of the Attorney General um, just this morning. It's also been uploaded to the drive. Um, 
It was uh, written by Jay Basil O'Malley, the third chief prosecutor, deputy attorney general, prosecution division. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input on bill number 12-36 COR. For your reference, we're attaching copies of our 2018 and 2020 statements to this committee regarding self-defense and the Castle Doctrine. The Office of the Attorney General remains in full support of the right to self-defense and the right to defend one's castle. As discussed in our presentation on Guam's self-defense law to the 35th Guam Legislature Committee on Justice, these rights, which are currently, these rights are, which are currently supported by existing Guam law. Our existing law, Title IX GCA Chapter 7, Article 4, already provides our people with a reasonable, viable, legal justification for engaging in self-defense. This same law already provides a person with the ability to stand their ground and use deadly force wherever the person may be. The only restriction imposed on a person standing their ground is a duty to retreat only if they can do so in complete safety. If a person does not feel they can safely retreat from a threat that poses serious harm, existing law, as mentioned above, already authorizes them to stand their ground and use deadly force. In all these situations, a person would be legally justified in his, her actions and would be shielded from a criminal liability. This duty to retreat when possible lies at the intersection of the castle doctrine and self-defense laws. As a community, we have long recognized that there are few inherently special places where we expect minimal disruption of our comfort, our privacy, our safety, etc. Our homes, our vehicles and our places of work, also known as our castles. These places are deserving of an increased level of protection and thus when defending our castles, we no longer have a duty to retreat. Last month, the Journal of the American Medical Association released a study entitled Analysis of Stand Your Ground Self-Defense Laws and Statewide Rates of Homicides and Firearm Homicides, which concluded with the following. Quote, the staggered adoption of SYG laws in U.S. states was associated with increases in homicide and firearm homicide rates across the U.S. These increases reach 10% and higher in several southern states, while no states had significant reductions in violent deaths, as advocates often argue when justifying these laws. The accumulation of evidence established in this and other studies point to harmful outcomes associated with stand your ground laws. Despite this, stand your ground laws have now been enacted in most states and the uptake of new stand your ground bills continues to be popular, unnecessarily risking lives. Attached is a copy of the study and the following related news reports. February 27, 2022, ABC News, why stand your ground laws may be connected to higher homicide rates. February 25, 2022, NPR, stand your ground laws are linked to an increase in US homicides, study says. 220, February 23, 2022, Mercury News, study, stand your ground laws linked to more homicides. February 22, 2022, Axios, Stand your ground laws linked to jump in U.S. firearm homicides. This year's report expands on studies reports from years prior, including those conducted by the American Bar Association's National Task Force on Stand Your Ground Laws that have come to the same or similar conclusions. Copies of prior year studies reports are included with our attached 2018 and 2020 statements. Given the results of these studies and reports, the legislature may want to consider that the adoption of a stand your ground policy in Guam might reasonably be accompanied by a mechanism to provide additional resources to all entities that play a role in the criminal justice system, from police officers and investigators to courts and prosecutors to victims advocates and direct service providers to victims. We hope this information aids your committee in its consideration. Sidzouis Ma'asi sincerely, J. Basil O'Malley, the third chief prosecutor, deputy attorney general, prosecution division. And uh, attached to this testimony are the, the reports that were cited uh, and their prior testimonies. And all of that is available, available again on the Google Drive. All right, we'll now hear from Agnes Mantanani. Ms. Mantanani?
of a day. Thank you for being here, Ms. Mantanani. You may proceed. Thank you. My name is Agnes Mantanani, and I am the broken mother of Joseph Michael Mantanani Zamora, who was murdered on June 23rd, 2020. He was only 37 years old. I am here today to not only tell you of my son's death, but to strongly object to these amendments to this bill that would expand the council law. June 23rd, 2020 is the day my son, Joseph Michael, Ma Joseph Michael Matanani Zamora was killed. He was shot three times at close range and the shooter used castle doctrine law as his defense or reason to kill my son. He was initially charged with murder and because he claimed castle law later, the murder charge was then put up for dismissal. The shooter knew my son. They called each other brother. He called me Auntie Agnes. He had my number on his phone. The shooter's mother would call my son from time to time to help her clean up her yard. My son Joey was welcomed into his home and was allowed to stay and bring his personal items into the house. In the afternoon, approximately 1.30 p.m. of June 23rd, my son was shot three times at close range. The autopsy revealed that the shooter held the gun so close to my son's chest that it left gun residue on his shirt. I asked myself, one shot, would it, would it have killed him or could he still be alive? Joey's death certificate states approximate interval onset to death, minutes, minutes to die without help. Those three shots with an unregistered rifle by an unlicensed individual. And so now I'm made to feel that it was justified and reasonable for my son to be killed under this law. When the police came, they found the shooter sitting on the front porch in a very calm manner. When they approached him, he admitted and stated, I shot him, he's inside. If the shooter felt he was in danger, he could have yelled and called out to the neighbors to call the police. The neighbors are so close that you can actually smell what they're cooking. When the judge was going through the dismissal hearing for the murder charge, she stated that this is the first time she ever sat to hear a motion to dismiss a case that took over an hour. She also stated that Joey's case is going to be a novelty case because someone was shot and killed and they used the council doctrine and they knew him. There's one word in the law that swayed her to say, we will dismiss the murder charge without prejudice. I was happy we won that, but I was also thinking, why the heck are we having this discussion? He was murdered. He murdered my son and he shot him three times with an unregistered nine millimeter feather AT-9 rifle. This shooter was not licensed to possess a firearm and he was charged with illegal use. Three counts on the gun charges. People are using the castle doctrine wrong. And I will tell you, even the attorney general's office has stated they don't like this law, how the law is written. So I am praying that you will provide testimony or language to fix this law. Aside from my son's falling victim to the Castle Doctrine, there are other cases. A couple lives together for three years. They broke up. The girl went back to the home to get her things. There was an argument. She was punched and beaten. The police arrested the guy. Then the guy claimed Castle Law. He was released and GPD arrested her. What if this was your daughter and she was punched and beaten and they used the castle doctrine or stand your ground law? What a mess it would be if it became law. Another situation similar to my son, a guy was invited into the house and property by the homeowner. He was told he could use the house to eat and shower. He walked in, had an argument with the wife. He was shot in the back and died. The shooter's defense, castle law. There's more, but I think you, you get where I'm going with this. The lies I see it is broken and it's an insult to me as a mother. Because of the poor wording of the council law doctrine, many using unreasonable deadly force under the guise of the law will get away with it. 
It's allowing people to use it and take another person's life. There was a wrong that was done under Castle Doctrine to my son, Joey, an evil that breaks and tears down the justice system as we know it. I mentioned to Speaker Trelawhi, as well as to the Attorney General's office, that I will be very vocal against the Castle Law Doctrine with the extension of the standard ground law. Senators, you want to expand Castle Law to make it easier for people to kill or cause harm to anyone they please. My son will probably never get the justice he is due. But if you push this law into existence, it will be much easier for people to get away with murder. And let me assure you that blood doesn't wash away that easy. It will cause havoc on many lives. I would like to ask, what is happening to make you want to push such a law? Who's pushing it? And must it be done in haste? Does the law and amended? and amendments make it easier for GPD to fight crime because this law would put deadly self-defense force in any private citizen's hand. Has the Guam Police Department indicated that this law would assist them in serving and protecting the average citizen? Will the legislative body consider adding any duty or retreat language so that if somebody wants to walk away, they can reasonably do so without getting shot or killed? even if there's a small window of opportunity to retreat, to avoid a deadly outcome, there is no provision for either party to take advantage for a peaceful outcome. Can women use deadly force to use it as a tool for domestic violence? How about teenagers? Can they use it out of fear of physical abuse? I believe that the Castle Doctrine Law is as written, it's not balanced. I come before you today to voice my pain, anguish, and concern about this proposed law. I have read that most Castle Doctrine laws almost always includes a stand your ground component in most states so that no person has to leave their castle before using force to protect their family. I feel, I feel we just need to help or fix this law and any amendments so that there is a balance on the force used and not excessive or inconsistent to the specific sets of circumstances. I humbly ask and I am praying that you look to God as a source of wisdom as you work on fair and just changes on the Castle Law Doctrine. It is 21 months to the day that my son was murdered. This is... This is my one and only beautiful son who was murdered. This is Joseph Michael Matinani Zamora. He will be forever 37. He was a victim by both the shooter and of Castle Law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matinani, and my condolences to you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Deborah Rages. Ms. Rages. Madam Speaker, if uh, if I may, um, can I please reserve my testimony to the end? Uh, no, please. Uh, yeah, we have several people lined up, if you can. Please okay, I'm, I'd you. like to hear what the, what the rest of the panel has to say before making my statement, my testimony. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, Ms. Rages, no, please proceed. Yeah, we have, yeah, and I'm, I'm also, there are also some testimonies that will be coming in, so I can't guarantee you a spot at the end. Yeah. Sure, we've heard from uh, three, three testimony from uh, three, sorry, uh, three people already. Uh, against the, the stand your ground bill. And I think there's um, a lot of the information that is, a lot of the testimony is maybe outdated, maybe not as accurate uh, as, as I think the, the public needs to hear. Um, the stand your ground uh, bill does a couple of things for us. 
the first the first uh, the first thing that it does is it makes it so that if if I were threatened in in an area that I had the right to be outside my house, business, or or car, that I would have the opportunity to defend myself or the lives of someone that I love um, without having to retreat. So that's the first thing it does. Just just like we have that right in our home business um, or or vehicle. The concern and the reason why I support this bill is because what if I'm taking a a walk, a leisure walk to exercise in the morning and I'm approached? Um, what if I'm walking from my what if I what if I've exited the doors of my business, my office, and I'm in the parking lot trying to get in my car and I'm approached? Uh, there is there's there's that that's the first reason this the second reason is if i were to have to use uh my anything and 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 my concern is that this there's several people who are going to testify today that think that for whatever reason this is a gun law it is not a gun law it includes guns and firearms but it is really the right to, to defend yourself. And so let's just you know put that out there. This is not a gun law. This is not us trying to, uh, anybody who's, who supports this bill, uh, trying to make this like the wild, wild west because it's not. The, the major concern that I have is that if I were to have to use defensive force or lethal force to protect myself. The, the issue that I have with not passing this bill is that I would have, I, who may have just hurt somebody or stopped the threat and in doing so may have caused uh, uh, death to somebody, um, I would be dealing with, there, there's just a lot. To take a life is a lot. And so I would have to be dealing with the trauma of that incident. And, and on top of that, it's the prosecution's job to gather evidence and prove that I did not use, did, that I did not use uh, or use all avenues to prevent the situation. Well, first of all, um, and so, so while the prosecution is gathering their evidence, why would I, who was defending myself in the true sense, have to bear the financial weight of the government while they do this, while they gather their evidence? There's gonna be a lot that I'm gonna be dealing with, with um, as an example, the headlines of the newspaper. I'm going to be on trial by by the public. I'm going to have to deal with that. I'm going to have to deal with the fact that that the person that I may have injured uh, or caused death to, I'm going to have to live with the fact that that is still someone someone else's son, daughter, husband, wife, still another human being, and that's a lot to live with. So, you know, I, 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 you know, that, that's got it. So that's, that's really um, where I stand on this. I support this bill. Uh, I, I think I speak for many other, many other uh, people who want the, want the ability to protect themselves. It's, uh, and this is not, this is not me wielding a, a, a bat or a machete or, you know, or even a firearm in public. And for people to come to this panel and testify that this is, you know, we're trying to make the WAMA Wild Wild West is re just ridiculous, really. So I, I support the, the, the right to defend myself. Should I be attacked? Should I find myself uh, in a corner? Uh, and I should not have to 
I should not have to run or retreat if I'm faced with deadly force. The only response to deadly force is deadly force. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Ms. Regis. And I hear from Paul Suba. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Speaker, Senators. Yes, I, uh, I agree with the Attorney General regarding the self-defense law that's already in place, but I do appreciate the fact that Castle Doctrine and the expanded version of Stand Your Ground puts a, a greater emphasis on the victim's rights to be protected. The complexity is that each individual case has their own uh, evidence, merits, and substance. Uh, the manner in which the person defended themselves or not. It really hinges on how the law enforcement community investigates the case and how the prosecution views not only the law, because it's it's going to really be affected by the case is going to be affected by what were what was the evidence was there an opportunity to de-escalate which in most cases and i was in one where it, the incident happened so quickly that you have to react in a manner to protect yourself or others where deadly force had to be used to stop the individual and we say not to kill but to stop the individual in law enforcement we don't uh, use deadly force and we use the escalation uh, use of force continuum. Uh, but in most cases, people aren't trained. They are not trained to know how to defend themselves or even to retreat for that matter if they are able to do that. What this law, what these laws have done is put the onus on the possible perpetrator to think there is this law in place. Is it worth my, uh, you know, taking the chance that this person is armed or this person is going to use force uh, to protect themselves. And then again, you know, not all individuals committing crimes read the news, uh, listen to or understand the laws. So there is a complexity behind this. It's human nature in many ways that uh, how, it, how they react to and, and understand the law and, and self-defense. The law is not the issue necessarily. It, it is, um, it underscores the need for people to be able to protect themselves and not have that uh, burden of proof always uh, to defend themselves in court uh, or in civil uh, litigation. It is to show the community that something is being done. It may not be perfect, but what I do recommend is people start getting educated on what they would do in critical situations because the increase in crimes that uh, Senator St. Augustine brought up, uh, not only on this island, but nationwide. What would you do in an event where you were under attack and your life depended on your uh, knowing what to do to survive? Uh, people don't think that way. And uh, just having a law is not going to uh, benefit them much if they're caught in that instance. Even if you know what to do, uh, when an instance where your life is threatened, uh, to the point of, that you could be killed or seriously injured, uh, you get tunnel vision. You don't know exactly how you're going to respond. You may have a gun, but if you don't know how to use the gun, it's not loaded, uh, you become a victim. Uh, if you understand the law that you have a right to defend yourself, but in fact, uh, do not follow the requisites to, you know, that it's self-defense and not uh, a domestic situation or something that was described earlier, where I believe there could have been a, a little bit more involved in the investigation of the case to determine if that uh, was a homicide, a murder case where uh, it wasn't under the uh, you know title uh, the ca uh, Castle Doctrine uh, legal aspects. So that's my my perspective. I agree with the Attorney General. There is the self defense laws. I agree that there this Castle Doctrine and the Stand Your Ground also emphasizes uh, the need for people to be able to defend themselves and not uh, you know, be mindful in an event uh, whether I should shoot or not shoot. I can tell you this, a lot of studies have shown uh, that police officers get killed themselves even though they're, they're more trained than the average citizen. And the reason that they, they are killed in the line of duty in a justifiable uh, uh, shooting incident 
is because they hesitate. They hesitate for several reasons. One is religious beliefs, uh, thou shalt not kill. Uh, the other ones uh, are just, uh, you know, moral, moral reasons, uh, their inability to react quickly to defend themselves or others due to the fact that uh, they're in fear that they're, they're the one that is uh, uh, committing a crime or that they're not justified. And so these are the things that uh, any law cannot uh, answer those uh, situations except good investigations that determine uh, what the outcome would be. And uh, we all know that there are all, always uh, situations where uh, even that will not uh, bring forth the, the truth of the matter. Uh, so I don't know what else to say. I, I looked at the bill and I understand the, uh, the uh, letter of it and the spirit, the intent, but it's gonna come down to each individual case and how it's investigated. Just my seat, Mr. Stuba. We'll now hear from Brianna Duenas. Hoffity, uh, Buenas and Hoffity, Senators, and everyone joining today. My name is Brianna Duenas, a member of the Social Work Student Alliance at the University of Guam. Searches of preparing students to enter the field of service and advocating for social justice on Guam. We are calling for this body to repeal bill number 12-36 COR. Upon review of the American Bar Association September 2018 report and recommendations for the National Task Force on Stand Your Ground Laws, we want to highlight statements such as the following. Stand Your Ground Law is unpredictable, uneven, and results in racial disparities. The report clearly states that it recommends that legislatures do not enact stand your ground laws because the empirical evidence shows that states with statutory stand your ground laws have not decreased theft, burglary, or assault crimes. Based on the report, multiple states have attempted to repeal or make amendments to the stand your ground law. Thank you for this opportunity and in closing, Swasa hopes this body moves to repeal bill number 12-36 and recommends looking for solutions to strengthen law enforcement and perhaps provide de-escalation self-defense training to, pre to prevent further preventable deaths amongst our people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duenas. Mr. Eddie Cruz. Mr. Cruz. Yes, sorry about that, I had to unmute. Um, yes, I, I wanted to testify in favor of this bill, uh, mainly because as a uh, self-employed farmer and business owner, we kind of need those protections. And, and what I mean about protections is that it'll probably never happen, but if it does, we need to be able to protect ourselves. We need to be able to have the options of doing so. And uh, through the years, I've had many threats on my life. I, I've been, uh, uh, had things stolen and whatever, and, and the response time by law enforcement, which I have been a law enforcement officer in previous uh, jobs, is, is very slow. In a matter of time, many things could happen. Um, on the other hand, I believe that the individuals that want to exercise that right, if this bill were to pass, should be trained. And I, I, uh, I took note on uh, Paul Suba's testimony about police officers, after being one myself, that sometimes we get hesitant, and that's how some law officers are, are killed. Well, private citizens are the same way. We don't want to take a life. But if that ever came to be a threat, we want to have that option. And we want to protect our families. We want to protect our property. It's funny that, uh, you know, you talk about uh, Castle Doctrine and everything else. Everybody, you know, that I know had concerns about it. The Castle Doctrine didn't cause a bunch of deaths. Didn't do anything except for it put a note out there, basically, for criminals to 
take note that if you did get into somebody's house or get into their place of business and threaten to kill them and they did retreat, that they could take the criminal's life. Well, I think stand your ground provides the same bold statement. If passed, it would provide notice to would-be criminals and would-be murderers that they may not survive th that kind of incident. So it's, it's a double-edged sword that I think must be considered. Um, I've never liked arming people that had no training. But on the other hand, there's a whole lot of uh, citizens that are trained, um, that are capable of handling a firearm and have, a, have a, a legitimate threat. So just saying that, I wanna testify in support of this bill and provide an option for some that need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. We're now here from Jamela Santos. Santos. Buenas done half a day to Speaker Terlahi and all honorable senators. My name is Jamela Santos. I serve as the vice president of the National Association of Social Workers, NESW, Guam chapter. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of our organization. NASW Guam chapter is in opposition to bill number 12-36 introduced by Senator Joe West and Augustine. The proposed expansion of the current Castle Doctrine law is similar to that of many stand your ground laws and resolutions already implemented in the United States. The effectiveness of these laws cannot be fully determined due to the lack of research showing that stand your ground laws have reduced crime and or increased public safety. There are recent studies, however, showing that in some states there have actually been an associated increase in homicides and firearm homicide rates since the enactment of standard ground laws as was referenced in previous testimonies today. In addition, there has also been a disproportionate impact on people of color due to the adoption of these laws. While it is yet unknown how these trends will translate to Guam, there is a definite risk that what has been documented in the United States could occur here as well, especially with regard to implicit ethnic and racial biases, if Bill 12-36 were to pass. Our brothers and sisters throughout Micronesia are often stereotyped to exhibit dangerous, aggressive, and criminal-like behavior. This is even more imperative when within the past few years, current events in the United States have pushed us nationally, globally, and locally to educate ourselves on the impacts of institutional racism, fear, and how deep-rooted stereotypes can lead to violence in our communities. This is the time to enact laws that build community connections and strengths instead of enabling potential violence, especially in situations where irreversible, even deadly mistakes with guns are made. Gun violence is a critical issue within our island community that should be limited and controlled, not expanded. Expanding the castle doctrine risks misinterpretation by members of the public who lack knowledge of the law or misconceive the law, since there are individual varying definitions of what is considered to be reasonable fear or imminent danger. The changes made to bill number 12-36 are still misleading and have a number have a similar risk of being misinterpreted. Although the presumption set forth in subsection A does not apply if the person against whom the defensive force is used has a legal right to be present, no single person will have knowledge of every other person's rights to be in a specific area. People who live in apartment buildings, for example, might not know every one of their downstairs neighbors and those who work for bigger companies might only know half of their coworkers. Those who are unaware of the legal rights of others could still feel justified to immediately use deadly force so long as they claim to be in fear for their life. Reasonable fear and imminent threat are left to the public to decide and immediately act on. 
While there are likely a multitude of scenarios you will hear today that will argue in support of this bill, we ask that you consider that there are also a multitude of scenarios that may not be represented today. Consider the voices of those who are stigmatized, stereotyped, and unarmed. For example, stand your ground laws have done little to provide protection to survivors of domestic violence. Bill number 12-36 presents too many unanswered questions and room for gross misinterpretation. We believe it will negatively impact our public safety on Guam and increase the potential for increased gun violence and increased racial discrimination. We urge all members of this esteemed body, Iles Liter Han Guan, to consider the damaging potential this bill could inflict on our island's community and oppose bill number 12-36. Sejus maasi, maraming salamat po. Sejus maasi, Ms. Santos. Audrea Venis Mendiola, ihagan from Malawan Guam. Afede. Please for the opportunity to provide testimony. Guahu si Audrey Venice Mendiola, member of the Indigenous Tamoru Women's Association, Ihagan the Malawan Guahan. I come before you on behalf of Ihagan the Malawan to express our concerns with Bill number 12-36. We do not support Bill number 12-36. We further call for a repeal on Guam's current castle doctrine law, Title IX, Guam Code Annotated, Section 7.11 and 7.114. Bill number 12 seeks to amend current castle doctrine law to expand justified acts of self-defense and eliminate the requirement of retreating before the use of force and in the face of imminent danger. While the intention of the bill may be to enhance protective methods for Guahan's people, we cannot support this bill for a few reasons. In the 34th Guam Legislature Bill number 149-34 was introduced and the Guam Police Department and Public Defender of Guam submitted testimony against passing bill number 149. As bill number 12 appears before the community in a similar shape and form to bill number, four, bill number 149, we should consider and apply the input of these agencies who are designed to protect and enforce. A significant danger and repercussion of the passage of Bill number 12 is related to Guam's prominent issue of family violence. The Judiciary of Guam 2018 annual report stated that the top offenses charged overall for family violence in 2016 is 457. Highest cases in 2017 for family violence, 372. And the second highest cases in 2018 is 287. The top misdemeanor offensive charge for family violence is 446 total highest cases in 2016, 366 total highest cases in 2017, and 280 total cases, highest cases in 2018. In light of these statistics, we should consider the complexities of domestic violence during intimate partner violence, physical assault, or sexual assault. The individual using abusive behavior is driven by the need for power and control. A possible problematic scenario would be if a victim attempts self-defense or uses any kind of violence against an aggressor the aggressor can use his attempt to exert their power and control to justify reasonable fear of danger and cause further harm or death to the victim. Additionally, bill number 12 has no potential to prosecute a victim survivor rather than the perpetrator if the perpetrator turns around and claims that the actual victim is a perpetrator because legally the victim survivor had no right to be on the property. In a similar case, the victim survivor called the Guam Police Department and because there, were, there was physical altercation, both parties were arrested. Bill number 12 was also, will also allow aggressors to inflict further violence on their victims without fear 
of prosecution or civil liability for a split second decision made while in the reasonable fear of danger. Even if someone has misinterpreted the law and is prosecuted, the damage would have already been done. The Hagen Famala and Guahan's mission as an organization is to promote the social welfare, welfare of Guahan and her people. We hold a close set of tomorrow, tomorrow systems in our work for the island. Two specific traditions we would call attention to is that tao tao, to treat others with the utmost respect as a member of humanity and in a guaiza, to be loving. Bill number 12 may be intended to safeguard Guahan's people and their property, but it leaves little to no room to allow for a violent free community established on Fat Tao Tao and in Aguaiza. The passage of this bill may in fact perpetuate the continu a continued normalization of violence toward all Guahan's people. The further we stray from these traditions, the more we allow for division in our people, dehumanization and criminalization of each other. We ask you to work toward the denormalization of violence. We ask that the Tamoru traditions of Fat Tao Tao and In Aguaiza inspire your decisions against the passage of Bill Number 12 and the repeal of Guam's current doctrine law, Title IX, GCA, Section 7.112, Section 7.114. Undonkulin asisu esma asi, kwan respeto i hagen from Malaw and Guahan. Susu asi, Ms. Mendiola. We have been informed that the, the Chief of Police will be presenting testimony opposed to this legislation, but we have not received that yet. Is there a rose titan? Rose titan or a. If not, then um, uh, Attorney John Morrison, Deputy Director of the Public Defender Service Corporation, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, members of the committee, um, and um, everyone here. Um, I'm John Morrison, the Deputy Director of the Public Defender Service Corporation. I'm here to offer testimony on my behalf and on behalf of our director. Um, we testified about a year and a half, two years ago on the last version of this. We were opposed to the proposed bill then. We're opposed to the bill um, today uh, for largely the same reasons. There have been some additional studies that have come out since then. As standard ground laws were passed in a number of states, they're now in a position to study them. and. Um, some of the findings are coming back. Um, I, I think they should raise alarm. First, I'd start where we sort of um, finished last time. Um, Self-defense as it exists on Guam has for um, generations been a, a viable defense, one that's worked in the vast majority of cases, um, one that's al allowed um, the attorney general to make um, reasonable charging decisions and um, for defenses when they when they truly exist. It's based on um, common sense and it's a justification defense. Um, when it's truly justified, um, we don't really need um, an additional standalone piece of law to, um, to codify it. The duty to retreat is something that we've talked about a lot and that does exist in the law, but I think um, it's getting confused a little bit. The duty to retreat only exists when the um, victim can retreat with complete safety. And I think attorney Tidenko was getting into this a little bit, but obviously if a gun's involved, if um, a perpetrator has a gun pointed at another person, it's difficult to imagine that there's going to be an opportunity to, to retreat with complete safety um, in that situation. Um, they, they simply can't run off at, you know, a thousand feet per second or anything. So, um, that's really not a situation that we see with any um, frequency in the criminal justice system that someone gets charged because someone was attacking them and they had a duty to retreat. It's um, going to exist in a, a small 
um, percentage of cases, not with any frequency that, that I've ever seen. Also, there's no current duty to retreat under the Castle Doctrine, um, and that covers certain places. I would say that as opposed to somebody pointing a gun at another person's head and then having a duty to retreat, I think the situation that we're more likely to see this in is if somebody is in a car. And I think we would all agree that if someone's driving in a car, someone is being aggressive toward them on the street or throws something at their car, they know they can safely drive off at that point. They don't have to get out and they should be charged with a crime if they get out and um, shoot at that person or into that person. So first, I would say that the self-defense law that we currently have on the books works quite well, um, and there's no real reason to uh, change it any further. Also, I think alarmingly, there have been um, in every place that studied it, an increase in violence in jurisdictions that have passed these laws, particularly in southern states where they were the first to pass them and where um, gun ownership might be higher than in some other states. Um, we're going to submit written testimony as well if the speaker will allow it. And um, some of the evidence that we have, some of the um, studies and the attorney general pointed to some of the same ones indicate that there's an eight to 11% increase in homicides in jurisdictions that have passed stand your ground laws. Also, I think even more disturbing than that is a sample of 300 stand your ground cases found that 69% of them, the triggering event was not um, the threat of violence against the shooter or the uh, person claiming the justification. In 69% of those cases, it was simply an argument. So it's things like, well, it's two in the morning and my neighbor's dog has been barking for two hours already and I'm going to go confront that person. And since it's two in the morning and they have a barking dog, I better take my gun. And the neighbor comes out and they have their gun because it's two in the morning and somebody's banging on their door. And you can see that an argument in, in that scenario, two angry people with guns, um, something bad is likely to happen. And in 69% of those 300 cases, they found that the triggering event that led to the person being shot or killed was not that they were being attacked. It was that there was um, an argument, a dispute among people. Some of the other uh, participants have also pointed to um, a racial impact of these laws, and that is definitely true. Um, studies have shown, and this will be in our written testimony as well, that when it's a white shooter claiming um, the justification and they've um, shot um, a black person that it seems justified five times more frequently than when it's the other way around. That is when a black person shoots a white person. So I think the racial disparity there is something that everyone should be um, concerned about. That um, formula doesn't follow perfectly on Guam, but there are um, scenarios I think we could imagine where um, one race or another is being um, is claiming this justification more frequently and it's being believed um, rather than other races. Now that's that's um, largely our submission on um, the, the proposed amend or the proposed revision to the stand your ground law to the um, the castle doctrine rather. But I would say that the castle doctrine as it currently exists, we do um, believe that there should be some changes, or at least everyone should um, consider them. And the first I would say is that the current Castle Doctrine only applies to situations where it's inside somebody's home, vehicle, or business. And um, some states have changed that to include the immediate vicinity outside of the home, the patio, the curtilage, that sort of thing. We do have a privacy interest in that area of our homes. Um, people do have outside kitchens and living spaces pretty frequently on Guam. So it would seem to me that if we were going to make a change, that that's something that would make sense to look at, that someone could just as easily be or more easily attacked in their outside kitchen than perhaps in their room behind a, a closed door. Also, and some of the other participants mentioned this, the current um, impact of domestic violence currently Victims of domestic violence, if they use deadly force against their perpetrator in the home, they are not entitled to a presumption of reasonableness. Other jurisdictions have changed that to reflect the scourge of domestic violence and um, try, to, try to remedy that situation as best the law can. 
Um, that's my testimony. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present on it. And I'd like to submit the risk written testimony. It's prepared and it's just being put into final right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Actually, we did receive the testimony from the Public Defender Service Corporation uh, signed by Stephen Hattori on March 23, 2022. I think while you were on the Zoom that that was submitted, but uh, we will have any amendments or additions to it as well. Thank you. Uh, so that again, senators has, is in the drive for your review, the, the written testimony by the Public Defender. All right, I think, um, is there a Megan Borja? Megan? Hello, yes. Hi, Megan. Uh, would you like to present testimony? Yes, hi, sorry. I am um, I noticed on the email that we're supposed to have our video on. Yes, yes. So I'm currently feeding my son, so is it okay if I remain, or if I keep my video off, or? Uh. Is that okay? I don't know. It's one of our rules, uh, not my rule, but it's a rule. And that they would just want to know, you know, that nobody's coercing you to provide the testimony, I guess. Uh, if, if it's possible, you know, before or after, just to, to show your video and then turn it off, I, I would accept that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and otherwise, uh, you may proceed. So Megan, Megan Borja. Yes. Hi, so um, my name is Megan Borja and I'm the daughter of Rose Titano. So I will be sharing her testimony in um, place of her, okay. My name is Rose Titano. I'm a resident of Guam. I'm just an average working woman, a mother and a grandmother. I also have an elderly mother that does not live in my home. I exercise my right to keep and bear arms and have legally owned and operated firearms safely for over 30 years. I rely on myself for protection. In the event of imminent threat to my life and that of my loved ones, police presence is not immediately available or guaranteed. Our current law protects law-abiding citizens from persecution, sorry, prosecution or civil action when acting in self-defense from intruders and attackers. This protection, however, is limited to one's residence, place of business, or occupied vehicle. This is just not enough. One, I check on my elderly mother at her home and should be able to protect and defend myself and my mother in the event of an intruder attack in her home. Two, my work schedules include late night callouts and extended shifts. My drive to work includes areas without working streetlights and isolated areas known for criminal activity. I've had my tires, I've had flat tires on my way home from work several times over the course of 20 years. There were times when I needed to stop for groceries and supplies late at night and should be able to protect and defend myself when I step out of my vehicle. Three, I have the responsibility of keeping my grandson safe while he is in my care. This should not be limited to the area inside my home. These are just three situations in which I should not fear prosecution or civil action for protection and defense from an imminent threat to my life and that of my loved ones. Therefore, I ask that our senators do more to protect the rights of law abiding citizens and work to expand Bill 47. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan, and, and to your mother, Rose Titina. Sisters Masi. That uh, concludes the 
the testimony or those who are here to pre provide testimony. We also have written testimony provided on the drive from Ron Laguatnia, Kelani Regis, Agnes Matanani, Georgina Garrido, Professor Ron Uggen, Andrew Anderson, Brian Palacios, Dr. Ron McNinch, the Office of the Attorney General and the Public Defender Service Corporation. Um, All right, I'd like to ask the, the sponsor, Ms. Uh, Senator St. Augustine. Oh, first, if I could recognize again, uh, the Senator's president, present. We've also been joined by Senator Joanne Brown. So that, that uh, uh, again, so we are here with Senators Joe St. Augustine, Senator Jose Pito Terlahi, Senator Taitigui, Senator Moylan, Senator Ada, Senator Duenas, and Senator Joanne Brown. Okay, so we'll begin with the, the sponsor of the bill. If he has any questions, Senator St. Augustine. No, I, I'm, Madam uh, Speaker, if, if I can be the last one on, on your call, of our colleagues, please. Thank you. All right, for questions? Okay, sure. Uh, you will also be a lot of closing. Okay, so, um, all right. Okay, then I will begin. Um, I wanna thank all of you, first of all, for your testimony, it's very helpful. Uh, this is a very, um, you know, it's a tough bill to deliberate. Uh, and so uh, all the testimony, I, I believe we will uh, consider very carefully. Uh, I am, we did hear testimony regarding the current self-defense law on Guam. And uh, that is consistent with the informational briefing that we held where uh, it was very made very clear that uh, there is a right to self-defense on Guam. You are allowed to use legal force in your self-defense of yourself under certain conditions in any location. And uh, that the Castle Doctrine um, makes it a presumption that that was that you were in reasonable fear of imminent harm or death uh, in your castle, in one of those places. So in this, this bill expands that to any place. It would expand the presumption that you were in imminent fear uh, because you, you, you said you were uh, pretty much. That's my concern with this is that, uh, um, first of all, in, um, you know, I, I do wish we had the attorney general present to ask some questions. I'm glad we have uh, the others and as well as the GPD who said they will be submitting testimony, but we have not received that yet. Um, but because my biggest concern is that because of the presumption being extended beyond the home uh, that, uh, well, I'm reading from this uh, legal defense fund, wait, sorry, it's called the, and NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where they particularly talk about um, stand your ground laws were promoted as deterrence to violent crime. They appear to actually foster violence and hamper law enforcement's efforts to secure public safety by nearly eliminating the cost of using legal, lethal force. Stand your ground laws incentivize the regular use of force. As a result, controlling for other factors, states with stand your ground laws experience significantly higher rates of homicide than states with such laws. And I guess if I, I could ask uh, Attorney Morrison, if you could expand, do you think that the presumption impedes um, the ability to investigate the case? And, or or what, what does that do? Um, is the investigation of the case by GPD the same in a regular self-defense law as opposed to uh, under the stand your ground law? Well, um, my only really point or my only real point of reference is um, cases that we've had since the Castle Doctrine has been passed. Um, and I can tell you in those cases, it still occurs to me that GPD does the investigation submits their police reports to the AG's office. And I guess the irony here in our um, Castle Doctrine Law is the AG's office, although they're prohibited from charging um, cases where the Castle Doctrine is merited or warranted, um, it's still their decision. 
they um, have charged cases where the Castle Doctrine is something that the defense um, claims existed or was viable. And um, if they're not in agreement agreement with it, the case still moves forward and it's left for a judge and in uh, most cases for a jury to decide. So I don't view that it's, um, I don't view that the Castle Doctrine has kept them from um, investigating and um, per pursuing cases where they thought it was merited. Okay, thank you. And um, the, there, there was some talk to, um, earlier about um, you know, home invasions and of course, uh, protecting yourself on your way to work. Does this bill, I mean, but we, you also said that um, self-defense, of course, is already allowed on Guam. Even le lethal, deadly use of force in self-defense is allowed on Guam. And uh, home invasions, I think, are covered by the Castle Doctrine, are they not? Uh, that a home invasion is, is exactly what the Castle Doctrine addresses. That is, uh, you are presumably, uh, in, you can say that you were in imminent fear in your home. And so that would cover the home invasion situations altogether. All Those are already covered under the Castle Doctrine. They are specifically um, the Castle Doctrine covers home invasion situations, but the truth is those have always been covered under our self-defense law, that there's no duty to retreat in your home. Um, and we point this out in our, our written testimony as well. The idea there is that if you're in your home, you've already retreated. Um, that's as far as you can go. Your back is already to the wall. Um, if you were running down the street, you would have been running down the street to try to get into your home. So if you're in there um, and somebody comes in after you, um, Forces, forces presumed to be justified. All right, and, and in your written testimony, um, it says to characterize, characterize the proposed bill as an expansion of the Castle Doctrine is thus erroneous and misleading uh, in public relative to public places. I, could you maybe just explain that for all of us who are listening? Well, the, the idea as I understood it um, from the intent of the Castle Doctrine was that it should um, protect primarily your home because that's, that's your castle. And it, it coincides with this ancient idea that um, you don't have a duty to retreat in your home because you've already gone as far as you can. That's a little bit different if you're just um, out for a walk on the beach um, because the beach really is not is not anyone's castle. It's a public place. So this is just an, an expansion. Um, I mean, it, it's calling it the castle doctrine, but it's we, we view it, it's really not. Um, and again, if you were on the beach and somebody put a gun to your head, you, you don't have a duty to retreat, I think, under the majority of those situations, because you can't completely and safely retreat in that situation. So I think as... Um, Mr. Suba pointed out that each of these cases is going to have to be viewed on its own, on its own merits, but I'm struggling to think of a situation where um, you would have a duty to retreat if somebody pulled a gun on you and tried to rob you while you were on the beach. All right. So you're saying under current law, you have the right to self-defense anywhere, even on the beaches, even in public parking lots, anywhere. Uh, you have the right to self-defense. You can use legal force if you are in fear of imminent serious injury or death. And you do not have a duty to retreat if you cannot do so safely, right? That's what our current law says. And the um, so, do you believe that um, that do you believe that this bill, if it's passed, should expand to the use of force, for example, guns? Or I'm I'm thinking about guns, uh, where guns are not registered. Well, um, I, I think that's a fair point. That the majority of these. Um, the majority of these homicides are going to be gun related. That's just seems to be the statistics. Um, I would leave that particular issue for the legislature to decide. It strikes me, of course, that um, it's a different can of worms when we're talking about an unregistered firearm. But we can't imagine that there are completely um, innocent situations where maybe it was granddad's gun um, and 
grandson just hadn't gotten around to um, registering it or something like that. So I mean, we, we could imagine situations where it would happen. But I, I think what the legislature was, is really concerned about here is um, criminals getting their hands on unregistered guns and then using those um, potentially against other criminals, against innocent people, and claiming um, the use of a just the use of this expanded castle doctrine. So I would I would really have to leave that to uh, the sponsor and the and the committee to to discuss. But I would say I can't imagine situations where an unregistered gun is um, sort of innocently possessed, or that we were. Um, trying to fight a harm that might not necessarily exist. All right. Well, I'm asking that because I think I, I read a case where here on Guam where there was an unregistered firearm used uh, and they claimed castle doctrine. And so I'm just pointing this out because there has been some testimony that, uh, you know, the gun owners are very responsible and I agree and that they take training and, and all of that. But those who are not registered firearms owners not are do not necessarily fall under that category, but but the law may have been applied equally to them, or this exemption may have been applied equally to them. And uh, I I'm curious, you know, or I want to know as a policymaker how we yeah we should move forward in that regard. Um, all right, and so so if we already have a. a a law that allows self-defense, it allows a use of deadly force in self-defense uh, anywhere. Um, again, uh, this removing the duty to retreat, um, ah. yeah, how would that change? I mean, how does that uh, change our behavior, I guess, uh, in public? Does it affect the prosecution of the cases? I wish the prosecutor was here. I would ask them that, but uh, I guess they have submitted their written testimony. Yeah, Mr. Moore. It may well affect um, the prosecution of cases that it's easier for someone to claim the, um, the justification and for there to be a presumption that, um, that it existed rather than um, going through the formal process. So um, I'm not sure what the exact statistics there are on other jurisdictions, what difficulties they've run into prosecuting cases. But um, I would say that there does appear to be a correlation of an increase in general um, homicides and um, that most of these weren't, most of these wouldn't be justified under our, that a significant portion of these wouldn't be justified under our current law, that people having a dispute over um, money, barking dogs or land disputes or, um, you know, mangoes that fell in my yard versus somebody else's. Um, th I think those are the sorts of disputes that we'd want to keep people from um, exercising this level of self-help with. All right. So um, when I'm reading 9GCA 7.86B2A, so that's the current law, the duty to retreat. It says uh, if, if the defendant knows that he can avoid the necessity of using such force with complete safety by retreating or by surrendering, surrendering possession of a thing to a person asserting a claim of right thereto, or by complying with a demand that he abstains from any action we had, which he has no duty to take, except that A, the defendant is not obliged to retreat from his dwelling place of work vehicle unless he was the initial aggressor or is assailed in his place of work by another person whose place of work the defendant knows it to be. So this even this duty to retreat is, is kind of clarified. It says you only have a duty to retreat if you can retreat with complete safety, right? And um, I guess I want to ask you, in your experience as a, a public defender, are there how many cases are we talking about where, you know, the, perhaps, you know, we're concerned with the decision in those cases that that the person uh, should, should not have been required to retreat? You know, I mean, do we have bad outcomes in the cases, in other words, that we need to fix something here with this law? Where uh, I, I think when I'm saying complete safety, I would think that that's where all those factors come in, where, where the judges are going to determine whether you could have retreated in complete safety and that's 
that's the example you described where if there's a gun to your head, it's kind of unreasonable for anyone to think that you could retreat in complete safety, things like that. But uh, do you see cases that we, you know, where the outcome has been bad, uh, where they have not been able to, or they've been, you know, kind of uh, held to a standard of retreating where, where, you know, uh, you feel that was unwarranted or that we shouldn't hold that standard. So I, I want to be clear what you and I are discussing is the uh, general self-defense law that's existed for a long time. This is this is outside and apart from the Castle Doctrine, but just our general self-defense um, law is what we're, we're describing here. And I, I've not seen cases where um, where I felt like there was a what was an unjust outcome with um, with the charges. When when we go to trial on these these things and we're claiming self defense, it's still the government's burden to disprove self defense beyond a reasonable doubt. The standard is there and the law is there, in my view, um, to um, have an overwhelming amount of just um, outcomes here. So I, I haven't seen situations where, um, say for instance, my client um, had a had a break in or was attacked. Um, out on the street with someone with a gun and and had to use had to use deadly force to defend themselves and the the attorney general said well we feel like um, you should have been able to run run away at 1200 feet per second and uh, we're going to charge you with some level of homicide I, I just have not seen a case um, like that there there have been cases and um, I have argued um, castle doctrine for um, individuals at magistrate hearings and the like where it looked to me like the shooting would have been justified under the castle doctrine and in those cases uh, the attorney general disagreed the magistrate judge disagreed and um i, I don't want to speak for the attorneys since those are ongoing matters in those cases but it, it looked to me as though things were proceeding more akin to the law that we already had the self-defense law okay thank you um all right i'm gonna open it up for questions from senator uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Um, you know, listening to the uh, to the testimonies of uh, different individuals, there's a uh, equal amount of people that are for the bill and and uh, against the bill. So I guess we're going to have to go back and and uh, rediscuss this and and uh, get get more information regarding, you know, if we're gonna pass this particular bill or what. So at this point in time, I'm just not committed to uh, to go one way, approve or disapprove. I just wanna listen to some of our legal, uh, legal uh, interpreters uh, regarding the bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Terlahi. Senator Taitikwi. So just want to say, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak on, a little bit on and make some comments and ask some questions on this very controversial, <laughs> very controversial uh, bill. Um, I'm a, a bit torn between uh, both sides, um, but comforted to know that there are laws in place currently now to uh, justify any types of, of, of you know, protection for the individual or uh, defending themselves. Um, for the attorney, um, Attorney Morrison, uh, since the passage, I, I wonder if you can answer this question. I'm sorry, too. I was hoping the attorney general would be here as well. But since the passage of the Castro Doctrine uh, Act, uh, Public Law 32, when one has, has this law been used as uh, a defense in Guam's court when justifying the defense of a person protecting their home? And can you please elaborate on examples, if any? Attorney Morrison. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I unfortunately don't have um, perfect statistics on that. You know, I can I can discuss cases that I've had a, a hand in that I've um, participated in. Um, and I have not personally argued Castle Doctrine um, in a case that involved um, the invasion of a home where my client was the homeowner or was um, was legally in there. I haven't had that. I have had a case where I argued Castle Doctrine um, as to someone was acting aggressively toward two people that were in a car, and um, deadly force was then um, was then used against the um, 
the initial aggressor there. And, and that's a case where um, the attorney general made a decision to charge it and to move it forward. And the, um, and the judges that we engaged with um, made a decision that they weren't going to dismiss it at that point um, based on castle doctrine, that they didn't, they didn't feel that the evidence was there, that it had been a, a per se justified shooting. So those are the cases that I've been involved in. Um, unfortunately, I just don't have um, the, the sorts of statistics that would show. Uh, Thank you. Um, and I guess then, are you aware of any Castle Doctrine Act used in Guam Court of Law that's ever been rejected as a defense? I think you mentioned something earlier. Is that the only one that you know of that has been rejected uh, by using the ca Castle Doctrine in court? That I'm aware of, yes. Um, it's not a law that's been with us for a tremendous amount of time, and the, um, the facts are obviously going to be very independent to those cases. So I'm, I'm not aware that, but um, it's possible that the attorney general has had to make some different charging decisions based on the existence of it, in which case I never would have seen the case anyway, because it wouldn't have come before me in, in the courts. So um, it's, it's certainly possible that they've had to take a harder look at um, justification defenses when there's a shooting or when there's a use of deadly force and that the ca a case has maybe perhaps not been charged out based on the castle doctrine. Okay. You know, um, on its face, Bill 12 sounds, sounds like a good idea, but what, what happens um, in an encounter when two people, both uh, lawfully in a public place, feel threatened by each other? Is a person who survives the encounter, uh, based on this bill, is the person who survives the encounter automatically considered the victim? That's a very good question. And again, it's one that I don't have a perfect answer to, but I, I think, yeah, probably. I mean, if two people, if, if in the situation I was using, say the, say we're arguing about a neighbor's barking dog and it isn't inside his home and I don't act aggressively and try to get in there and um, we're having an argument, say outside in the yard about why can't you keep your dog quiet? And we're both holding guns and the argument escalates. Um, at some point, if we're both feeling that the other is an active threat of deadly force against the other, then it seems that both people may be justified in shooting the other one. And um, that that's just an absurd result that, that, could, um, that could occur. And yeah, the, um, the person that survives might not, might not be charged out if they're presumed to have been um, under the um, fear of deadly force. I mean, obviously this is this a little bit because I'm in his yard and should I have really been there? But I mean, we, we could take it into a, a more neutral situation where it's just a, it's just a straight up road rage dispute. That's something that, that has occurred in other jurisdictions. And, um, it's would, would almost certainly, would almost certainly occur. Are you familiar with the um, American, I think it's the American Bar Association's uh, task force regarding addressing um, the stand your ground? Are you familiar with that uh, write-up? I think it's a study that I had the last time I testified on this. We, we looked at some more recent um, Journal of the American Medical Association peer-reviewed studies for our submission this time around, but um, I think in general I'm familiar with it. Okay, can, can you tell me what the, the just in summary, a uh, small summary of uh, the recommendations? Well, maybe, um, maybe it would be better to go back and look at my prior testimony, but I, I, my recollection is that the um, journal or the American Bar Association had some of the similar concerns that, that I expressed today, and I think they sort of fueled some of these um, points forward that um, there's potentially a, a disparity in racial um, in using this law. In enforcing this law, there's a there's a racial disparity that there's been an increase in violence, and um, really doesn't deter the um, harm that was um, sought to deter. Okay, well, thank you so much. And just one last question for you with regards to this uh, Bill 12, um, the Castle Doctrine. Um, do you feel that uh, like? You talk about the the homes, you know, being able to protect yourself in your home. But what about the yard or the carport? Is that can still uh, still considered, you know, a uh, an area that covers <clears throat> that is covered by castle doctrine? 
is not. Um, the yard is spe specifically excluded from protection, and that's um, that's one of our points. I think is that if the if the committee wants to talk about changing the castle doctrine, we think that might be something worthy to take a look at because you can certainly imagine being in the outside kitchen um, and being even more vulnerable in that um, circumstance than you would be inside your home behind a locked door um, with all the means to protect yourself. So if there was a shooting in a yard at this point, our analysis would go back to just a general self-defense analysis. It would not um, it would not entitle somebody to the presumption of reasonableness under the castle doctrine. Okay, so the yard and also carport. So it's kind of in hand, as long as it's not behind a closed door, then, okay, so the recommendation to, to make a change to that. Okay, um, other than that, I, I thank you uh, for testifying and being the only one here right now answering these legal questions, but I appreciate it, you being here. And thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to ask some questions. I appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Taitsugui. Senator Moylan. Uh, Senator, um, Mr. Morrison, in that situation we were just talking about in the in the yard, does the self-defense law still apply though, even though Castle Doctrine does not? Self-defense absolutely applies in that situation. We would have to look about whether or not the force used was proportional to the threat, um, whether or not they had a reasonable opportunity to completely and safely um, remove themselves from the situation, and the jury would still be obliged to um, find that, that self-defense was disproven beyond a reasonable doubt at a trial. All right. The uh, Senator Ada, I, I don't know. I don't think he's here. Um, Senator Adda. Senator Duenas. To do Monsi, Madam Chair, and obviously today there's been some uh, very um, compelling testimony. Um, and um, Ms. Matanani, I do want to also express my condolences. Um, you know, while, while I understand you know, the discussion overall in terms of uh, the law that we're, that we're debating or the possible potential law amendments to law. I, I have to say that my experiences in listening has been um, basically a, a difference between uh, the application of the law and, uh, and, in, and the law itself in terms of uh, how uh, it gets resolved or, or applied uh, when it's being adjudicated when, when there's cases involved. So I, I, I guess my position so far is I, I have to agree with Chief Suba and his observation, uh, as well as um, Deborah Regis, uh, at least for my interpretation of what I've heard so far. Um, the individual's rights, I believe, um, and their ability to protect themselves and their families and their property I think is is contained well in Bill 12. So I just wanted to offer those comments. I'll continue to listen. And like Senator Peter Talai said, you know, we we certainly have our work cut out for us. I think you know all of us understand that. I just wanted to uh, make my observation that, uh, that this this is the confluence that I see here is is a discussion of, of you know the potential of this law and the effects of it, and then uh, discussing the potential of the application of law and the way. Uh, judges make decisions the way prosecution and defendants, um, you know, bring forward their case. And uh, and I guess with all laws, you know, that's sort of, that's the test, right? Um, does does the law going forward uh, end up being defective and have a, a negative impact overall? Or, uh, or is it, uh, you know, uh, does it uphold the test of the application? So I'll continue to listen, continue to take in information. But I think... Uh, I want to thank everybody for the testimony, but um, you know, Chief Chief Suba, I appreciate uh, your contribution, uh, everybody's contribution. But I I, I concur with your analysis uh, as well as Ms. Rages. So uh, I'll just continue to listen, Madam uh, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to offer some comments. Thank you, Senator Duenas. Senator Joanne Brown. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I also appreciate uh, the testimony that's been provided this morning with regards to this bill. And I, I have to tell you, it obviously it's not an easy call. 
uh, with regards to the intent of the bill and what the potential outcome should be should we pass it. I, I think it, it, it brings to light, obviously, a growing concern in our community that more of our people these days do not feel safe. Um, but yet I'm also having to weigh, how do we deal with these type of situations and is this the answer? Um, because every circumstance could bring, you know, begin a whole bunch of different facts that can come into play depending on what the circumstance is, how situations can be escalated, um, and what our reactions will be. I, I don't know. I mean, if I were in a very heated situation where I was feeling threatened, uh, how would I react? You know, how would I react when we're not in a rational situation and we do feel threatened? Is this the way that we're going to protect ourselves? Uh, every circumstance might have different situations involved. Um, and certainly sometimes depending on, on how you have faith, if you have any faith at all in the judicial system, do you think that you're going to find justice or do you, do you carry justice in your own hand at the end of a gun? And do you make that determination there and then at that moment? So this is a very difficult uh, bill. I understand the intent of it. I'm not settled as to whether or not I will vote for it at this time. I think we need to look at the unintended consequences that can come as a result of this. But I, I definitely understand where the sponsor of this bill is coming from and his opening comments. And I was, I was listening to, to his presentation. Also, he's on the radio this morning prior to the hearing, uh, relaying his position. I'm sure he'll elaborate on it further uh, before we conclude on this bill. And I share those concerns. I, I've, I've lived on Guam most of my life. This is the most uncomfortable I've ever been in my own community of which I have grown up, of which I have tremendous love and care for. Uh, not just my own safety, but more importantly, the safety of my family. And so certainly when the Castle Doctrine originally passed, I'm very supportive of it because I think people should feel, uh, you know, that when they're within their own home, that they should be safe. And if anyone intrudes upon that to bring harm to them, uh, they should have a means of being be able to, to react and protect themselves and their family. And I've had that situation. I've had that situation of a drugged individual running down the street and jumping over a five foot fence and gate uh, to get into our yard and threatening us and our family. And my dad was there at the time. And, you know, my dad is uh, served in action in Vietnam and is very, you know, well orientated with how to use a firearm. Unfortunately, my dad was able to hold that individual until the police showed up. Thank God they showed up. Uh, but when you're in that circumstance, when you fear being threatened and you're not dealing with a rational person or a person that's on drugs, uh, that's not thinking clearly and, and presenting a threat and a harm to you in your own home. Uh, it's a very scary situation. And, and it takes a lot to, to maintain your calmness and your, your, your sense of mind uh, so that you don't react because, you know, pressing that trigger is not that hard. It's not that hard to do. It can be done very quickly. Um, and that's the challenge. How do, we, how do we balance that? How do we ensure that our residents have the you know, the ability to safely protect themselves uh, when they feel they're threatened, when their, their well-being and their safety is threatened. Uh, but the challenge is how do we take this that we do within the safety of our home or our car and translate that into anywhere that we're at? Because not everybody's rational. Not everyone's of clear mind. Uh, some people, uh, any little thing can trigger them. And are we going to get into a trigger happy society and then we'll figure it out later who's responsible? Uh, because someone just wants to be a vigilante. And, you know, you remember the days where the generation remember watching all those Charles Bronson movies? Uh, you know, maybe people will say it's just, but is that, is, that, is that our society? Is that how we should go about doing this? So I, I know there's no set, there's no cookie cutter answer to this circumstance because there could be all kinds of dynamics in place of what can occur. There's nothing now that stops me or anybody else from getting a concealed weapons permit or carrying a gun. Of course, hopefully you, you are of the view, you're hoping that people that do carry concealed weapons are doing it to protect themselves and not intentionally trying to put themselves in a circumstance where they're gonna go out and harm somebody. But if they feel threatened, I, I, I know we already have the ability to do that now. It's just a question of where is the blame? You know, it's, it's, if we have this in place and someone can say, maybe there are only two people involved and I shoot somebody and they're not here. Uh, and I end up essentially, um, shooting them. And then I just claim, well, that person tried to bring me harm. They were threatening me. There's nobody there to tell otherwise. How do you know I'm not the perpetrator in that circumstance? I mean, we all, we all want justice. We all want to ensure that, um, you know, the right things happen. Uh, but I, I have to say, you know, even listening to testimonies more, I was hoping that would give me some sense of, of how to, to address this in a way where I could support the bill. 
but I, I'm still torn with regards to that. And I'm, I'm still leaning at this point that if there are other laws already in place that can address this, um, I know that that's there, then I have some comfort that we can still, still address our safety outside of our homes and outside of our cars if necessary. So with that, Madam Speaker, I really don't have uh, further comment and I, I'm always uh, open to listening to any further testimony or input uh, that our residents have with regards to this bill. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, Senator Brown. Senator San Augustine. Okay, this, is this for closing also, uh, Madam Speaker? Uh, well, if you have questions first, yeah, um, for the panel um, or either. Oh, okay, then then I'll just go ahead and provide my closing and uh, um, and, and for the, the listening audience and my colleagues, the intent of this essay is not to encourage the Wild Wild West type of environment. It is to provide safe, safety and security for our families. No one, and I say no one, should ever be victims of one's assault or fear for their life or the lives of their family. And you know what? Um, there is never any one bill that's going to answer all the questions. And that's why we have the public hearing. And I thank you, Madam Chair, for the, the public hearing. And I encourage and ask everyone for uh, any of your recommend, any amendments you, you believe we, we should put in this bill. Let's put in the bill. Let's fix it. Let's get this fixed because... Um, the testimonies uh, are, are, are split. And, and all I'm saying is I'm just trying to reach out and figure out and asking the people who want to help us make the bill or make the law that will be able to fulfill the desires of the people who want. And with that, um, I look forward to hearing uh, the additional recommended amendments. And then we can move on. And hopefully this bill will, will reach the floor and then it'll be further deliberated on the session for Sizus Marcy, uh, Madam Chair. Sizus Marcy, Senator San Augustine. As, uh, as pointed out earlier, I think we have our work cut out for us, yes, to um, either improve the bill or to um, consider, well, to fully consider the input of all those who have presented testimony and um, Again, you know, my, my concerns, uh, I, I'm hoping we can address. Uh, and I just want to clarify some, some things that were said today. So we have uh, like three issues going on in this hearing. One is the right to self-defense on Guam. And I think uh, we've tried with prior informational briefings and uh, those who have testified have also done a very good job, I think, of pointing out that Guam's self-defense laws are very robust, they, they're strong. They, if you claim self-defense, you have that right, and you have the right to use lethal, deadly force in self-defense. And so our law describes, you know, uh, that uh, when that, that um, you know, you must be in imminent fear of danger to yourself or uh, your loved ones. Uh, and so that's one, self-defense. And that, uh, in fact, the, the laws are so strong in, in favor of self-defense that they, they put the duty on the prosecutors to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you were not acting in self-defense. And that's, uh, that's, that's not the same law across the United States. This, this is very strong in Guam because of that duty on prosecutors to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you were not using self-defense if that is what you claim. Second, of course, is the Castle Doctrine and we've talked about that. So, so in the use of self-defense, we have uh, a duty to retreat if you can do so with complete safety. Complete safety, that's our existing law. The Castle Doctrine made a presumption that it would be reasonable. It's a reasonable, um, instead of having to determine whether you had a reasonable belief that such force is necessary to prevent bodily harm or the commission of a felony, that if you are in your house or in your car or in your workplace, you are presumed to be reasonable that uh, the deadly force in defense of a person or property is presumed to be reasonable. So that presumption is what really we're extending here. It's, it's not that we're extending the right of self-defense by this bill, 
we're extending that presumption that is currently used only for homes that you are presumed to have acted reasonably, or had a reasonable belief of, or fear, a reasonable fear of, of uh, harm. And we, they are expanding this um, to, according to the bill, to, to any area, to anywhere area where you have the right to be. That presumption that you acted reasonably. And so uh, I'm reading again from this report from the NAACP that says, uh, in many states, those who are found, uh, sorry, pursuant to stand your ground, the exercise of deadly force in defense of persons or property is presumed to be reasonable. And in many states, those who are found to have used such reasonable lethal force are immune from criminal prosecution and civil actions. Uh, thus, unlike traditional self-defense laws that mandate a retreat from violence, stand your ground laws encourage the use of deadly force when there is a reasonable belief that such force is necessary even if retreating is a viable option. And then it, it, it talks in another part about once a homicide does occur, stand your ground laws weaken the capacity of the justice system to enforce laws against violence. Stand your ground laws create additional burdens for criminal investigators who must collect evidence to disprove self-defense claims in any incident involving the use of force. Moreover, because stand your ground laws presume the use of deadly force is reasonable, law enforcement officers may only conduct a cursory investigation of an incident when at first blush, the lethal actions taken to meet a perceived threat appear warranted. The failure to thoroughly investigate would in turn hobble prosecutors' ability to make a full presentation of the facts at subsequent proceedings. This is the one point that I'm hoping uh, you know, we can clarify uh, once we receive GPD's testimony and um, maybe further clarify with the Attorney General who is also charged with prosecuting these cases despite the claims of self-defense, despite the Castle Doctrine, and, and it would be despite the Stand Your Ground uh, defense that, um, yeah, you know, we want to deter crime. We want those who are guilty of um, killing someone else uh, to really receive justice. And so we want to ensure, I want to ensure that the attorney generals and the police are able to really investigate that and lay that out. And that we do not by any presumption stymie an investigation or a prosecution because, you know, because we've statutorily, you know, limited them, their ability to do that. And uh, I just think we've seen in prior cases that when the facts really get all laid out, what, what was at first glance looking, you know, one way uh, may to a jury look completely different, like uh, in regards to self-defense or what was reasonable under the circumstances. So, you know, I, I have faith in justice system as to reasonable, you know, under those particular circumstances, I agree with Chief Suba and all those who've testified that said, yeah, consideration of all the circumstances is, is warranted. And, and so, um, yeah, we will, we would, um, yeah, we were going to continue to accept testimony on this bill for 10 working days, which concludes on April 7th at 5 p.m. So we could uh, please receive testimony. You can send it to um, Senator Terlahi Guam at gmail.com or deliver it here to the Guam legislature. Uh, thank you. And so there being no additional individuals to present for the testimony, the committee will consider Bill 12-36 COR duly heard. And the public hearing is now adjourned and the time is 11.01 p.m. And see, Zulus Masi, again, to all of you who have taken the time to testify today. Zulus Masi.